Three years ago, retired teacher Ken Wallace came across two silver coins. Within months, he had found thousands. It was the largest hoard of Iron Age coins ever found in Britain. The field is now rated among the top ten Iron Age sites in Western Europe. But its discovery had to stay top secret for over two years, and only now can we tell his story. Why were thousands of coins buried in this tiny field? Find out as I solve the mystery of the East Leicestershire hoard. Treasure. It's all around us. Look at that. Every day, new finds are bringing our history to life. I think we've got a find over here. I'm Miranda Kristovnikov. Join me in this hidden world where passions run high, where secrets are kept, and where serious money can be made. The world of hidden treasure. Ken Wallace is a field walker. He spends his weekends with a group of friends looking for clues that will help map out their local area's archaeological past. It's part of a community archaeology scheme run by Leicester County Council. Usually, they find little more than an assortment of broken pots and the odd brooch clip. But one day, Ken was out alone and he made the find of a lifetime. I couldn't wait to hear his story. We'd field walk this with the local field walking group. There was an area that had some bones in it. We weren't sure what they were. So I came back about a week later. They turned out to be pig bones, but lying on the surface with two fragments of silver coins. Just on the surface of the soil? Yeah. And these were broken coins, were they? These were broken fragments. Right. But I could immediately tell, because of the shape of them, that they were Celtic. And I scrubbed around with my boot, and a silver denarius came up. Fantastic. So, so what I, happened then? I mean, uh, uh, did you dig uh, for more? No, or? I left the field and contacted the farmer, asked them permission to metal detect, and I came back, and we got about 200 coins out of it, just like this. Fantastic. And that's when it all started, really? That's when it all started. And the coins kept coming. He soon had hundreds more, which he took home for safekeeping. Ken and his wife Hazel invited me back to take a look at them. Now, I mean, just looking at these now, they, they, I'm just stunned. What, would, what was the reaction of the experts when they came along and, and they sort of saw these coming out of the field for the first time? Well, the m local museum, I think you need a beep after what they say. <laughs> was it really? Yes, it was an expletive. It was so excited. <laughs> And in such good condition after well, so long. Well, it's not just that, but yeah. when you look at them, you, you can think of the craftsmanship that goes behind them. They weren't made by somebody who was, you know, uncouth. <laughs> they're made with care and attention. Yes, they're beautiful. And they are rare, which makes Ken and Hazel's coins potentially very valuable. They will have to keep their discovery secret until all the coins are out of the ground for fear of arousing the attention of thieves. What does it feel like living in a village... <coughs> like this, which is obviously quite a small village, and you've got this enormous secret that you're keeping that you haven't shared with the village yet. Not very pleasant, actually, because uh, mm. you can always think of people who really should know, and obviously you can't tell them. Uh, that's been very difficult to live with. It's made us seem like very boring people because we've not been able to tell people what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> But they had told the county archaeologist, and Ken and Hazel's prompt action gave a team from the University of Leicester a rare opportunity. They were able to excavate whole groups of coins from the ground and look for nearby clues. They found 15 different caches of coins. One of them was found close to a mysterious lump of metal. The whole block of earth, including the metal, was sent down to the British Museum for examination under laboratory conditions. Every fragment was a vital clue. And, for good measure, they also sent down a lump of soil studded with coins. British Museum conservator Marilyn Hockey had the job of separating the soil from the coins. There are so many coins on this site, and uh, we've had two large blocks of soil brought to us, containing coins, containing uh, other fragments. You could see there were lots of coins in the block, and in fact, when you look at the x-ray, it's absolutely full of coins. The conservation staff at the British Museum were stunned. X-rays revealed hundreds and hundreds of coins trapped in the mud. There's much more in there. 
They also gave a tantalising glimpse of the metal object in the soil. What was it? A bowl? A cooking pot? Might it even be a helmet? Once I've worked down, we'll be able to get all the fragments out and see exactly what we've got. The painstaking task of scraping away the soil to reveal the whole object was conducted with little more than a toothbrush and a scalpel. Meanwhile, the British Museum also had to write a report on the hoard. This was for the coroner, who was required by the Treasure Act to rule whether the hoard was officially treasure. So Ken and Hazel brought down the latest batch of coins. As much as they'd like to, Ken and Hazel can't hold on to their coins for very long. They have to bring them here to the British Museum for coins expert Jonathan Williams to catalogue and identify in readiness for his report to the coroner. And the time to hand those coins over has come. The British Museum was certainly not taking any chances with Ken's coins. Security was tight. But what would the coins be able to tell us? Now, all of these coins come from around where your site's located. On the one, they're all made of silver. We've got a rather splendid kind of abstract Celtic horse. Now, what we've also got here, and this tells me an awful lot about this site, this is a coin from a completely different part of the country. This coin made by a tribe that uh, we think we call the Atrabates, and they lived around the area of modern Hampshire. And what the presence of this coin and this other one, which again, from south of the Thames all the way up in Leicestershire, tells me is that this is a site with, with countrywide connections. Jonathan went on to show how coins could be used to create a tribe... coins that I'd use to, to buy stuff with. I bet that some of the times they were used for buying and selling things. But one of the things about coins in Iron Age Britain is that we tend to find them on religious sites. Looks like these coins are deliberately put here as a way of devoting money, giving money over to the gods. Now, what is so important about this hoard? Finds like this are extraordinary, very rare. And it's such a big contrast from another site, a rather sad story, a bit further down the countryside, down towards Surrey in Hampshire a temple site called Womborough. Um, archaeologists got wind of this site only after the, the uh, thieves had, unfortunately, ransacked the place. We went down to Womborough to find out more, but nothing could prepare us for the story that local archaeologist David Graham was waiting to tell us. This is the beginning of the site that's been looted. And you can see some of the holes. I think you don't fall in. My goodness. No. There's one there, one there, one over that direction. This is the core. It. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? The site has been repeatedly ransacked over the last 20 years. There's a hole up here that, um, when we came a couple of years ago, had a dead deer in it. So this is one of the holes? Yes. Yes. It's huge. We knew you'd had problems. I thought we were going to find sort of little little half bucket sized things. Mm. I couldn't believe that anybody digs ponds. We've had a JCB out here at night loading up a big <clears throat> tipper lorry with material. I mean you could have make a swimming pool out of the hole that was left. Wanbra's past had been stolen and was lost forever. What so, was the value of those coins that were dug up? Something in the region of three and a half million pounds. There could be no clearer reminder about the need to keep quiet about Ken's find. Now seeing the devastation on this site, 
how do you feel about the importance of keeping your site secret? Well, we, we, we lo- we've made a lot of people miserable, I suppose, by not telling them. <laughs> but now I'm glad that we haven't told oh, them. Oh, it's made yeah. the awful the, the, effort of keeping the secret worthwhile. Yes. Yeah. Ken and Hazel's speed of action and secrecy had protected their site, but they couldn't keep their secret forever. They had to get all the coins out of the ground before looters got wind of the hoard. So we headed back to the site to finish the job. I wanted to help, so I asked Ken for a quick metal detecting lesson. This is what we call a motion detector, but when you go over an object, it will give you an noise. Detectors work by creating a magnetic field that penetrates the ground. If something metallic gets in the way, a signal is sent back and the detector gives out a warning sound. I'm trying to overlap the sweeps. I soon got into the swing of things, and within seconds I had a signal. Just there. You sure? Yep, right in the centre there. Break it in half. Okay. That's... <laughs> and this is going to be a bit of rusty nail, is it? More than likely. <laughs> That's, oh, hang on, it's not my ring, is it? <laughs> hang on a second. Cut. <laughs> Lesson <laughs> number one. Okay, right, you Lesson do it. There the... you go. Can I hand it to the expert? God, I'm such an amateur. <laughs> You open it. <laughs> oh my god, look at that! Wow! Fantastic! Look at that, that is that's beautiful silver. So is that one of your Iron Age? That is points? indeed. Just just talk me through. What's that what's that on the back? You can just see a little horse about the size of a little fingernail. Wow, that's just made my day, month, year. Right, that's now amazing. you should check the area again to make sure there weren't two. Okay. Do you want to stick there? Oh, very strong, very strong. I can see it. Look at that. Sticking out of the earth. It's another little gem. So these, these coins are everywhere. I mean, that's that's two in a, just a few metres. Mmm, you've hit a good that's spot. That's amazing, look at that. Meanwhile, the archaeologists were completing a geophysics survey. Geophysics works by measuring tiny changes in magnetic fields. The results are used to map out possible underground structures. And the results were encouraging. There was a chance that Ken hadn't just discovered the largest hoard of Iron Age coins in Britain. He may also have discovered a temple complex as well. Archaeologist Vicky Priest painted the picture for me. She began by showing exactly where the main coin hoards were found. We had a a linear trench running along here with an entranceway in the middle, about here. And then we had the coin hoards, 13 of them, and these were situated about there. And then over here, we had, um, just about there, We had something, a big mass of iron, which we think is a bowl or a helmet of some kind. Vicky thought that the coins had been placed at the entrance to a rectangular temple complex. If she was right, the entrance would hit two ditches to the north and south, with an easterly ditch completing the rectangle. I left Vicky and her team to look for the rest of the entrance ditch. It was now time to see what was coming out of the soil block. So I took Ken and Hazel down to the British Museum to take a look. The soil block was beginning to give up its secrets. But apart from the odd coin, all I could see was a rusty bowl. Luckily, British Museum Iron Age curator J.D. Hill was on hand, and what he saw was a Roman soldier's helmet. You've got... that's the helmet and you can now actually see it is a helmet. Marilyn's already taken off the bits of iron and silver from the top there. So the helmet's there, and the coins are mixed up with bits of animal bone, which was a complete surprise. And you can see that's, that's probably a bit of dog jaw. And there's lots of little bits of bone, and they all go right up to and overlap the helmet, so they must have gone in the ground at the same time. We've got some fragments of silver that have come up, and one of them was some... This little animal head here. Which oh, super. Oh! Isn't that great? Hey. <laughs> 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 
So that was that oh, was the first no. clue, wasn't it? Yes. That we were dealing with a decorated Very silver helmet. Decorated helmet. And we don't know what it is. Lion? Is it a mane? A lion. It looks like there's a mane coming down mm. here. The little ears. Oh, that's really Amazing, beautiful. Oh. The coins and silver helmet were fantastic finds in their own right. But what about the bones? Why were they there? We took JD back to the site to look for more clues. And before long, the site began to reveal its macabre secrets. Is there something here as well? Or is that yeah. There was evidence that these might be killing fields. As you can see, we started taking a look at these and they're absolutely jam-packed full of disarticulated animal bone. Well, I would say this is evidence that we're dealing with a ritual site here. But there was still no sign of a temple enclosure. What was going on? My goodness, you've been busy. We certainly have. <laughs> Loads of digging going on. Talk me through what's happened. Um, it's all got very weird. <laughs> Down there, we have huge quantities of animal bone. Right. So where all those people are all digging those people is, are. is littered and with we animal we bone. We simply didn't expect that. So, so what might that, that huge concentration of bone tell us? Well, the really... The odd thing that seems to be happening now is that we thought this was a temple, a building or a shrine. Yep. This isn't a temple, a building, a shrine. So what is it then? A prehistoric abattoir with a bank next door? In fact, what Kenner discovered is an open-air ritual site where the hill had been divided into two halves by a ditch. Cutting through this ditch is an entranceway where Ken found the coins and helmet. Each half of the hill had a specific role. On one side, coins were deposited, and on the other, animal bones. Just as we were beginning to make sense of the site, Ken made a vital discovery. Vicky! What have you got? Look at that. Wow. Brilliant. What is it? That. It's Celtic. Yeah. Don't know what it is. There's no doubt about what that is. This is um, a handle which goes on a large wooden tankard for drinking mm -hmm. out of. Tankards are a type of drinking vessel which, which starts in, to be used in this country from about 100 BC onwards. And usually because the wood rots away, and all that's left are the handles themselves. And this is a really fine example of a handle. The tankard handle found by Ken proved to be the final piece in the jigsaw. It was evidence that ritual feasting had been conducted on site. And it was some feast. JD took me over to have a closer look at the leftovers. There were thousands of bones lying on the ground. Each bone was being carefully recorded before being removed for further analysis. We found Vicky photographing a pig skull. OK, so are you ready to raise this now? That's right. It's now being photographed and recorded, so it's now a matter of just lifting it out of the ground. Fantastic. OK, okay. so um, what happens next? Have you? Well, <laughs> what, on, what's going to happen next it? is we thought you'd like to do it. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yes. No. So if, you, if you go behind you, yeah. you'll find a, oh, a trowel and a shovel. And a shovel. Oh, so cool. Do you want to pass me that? And it'll come across. Okay. Yeah, it could be quite vigorous. Can I? Oh, yes. Sure. Yes. I think everyone thinks archaeology is so delicate. <laughs> well, it is. Oh, Actually, no. it isn't. <laughs> now put it straight into the shovel. There we are. I mean. So is, does all this need to go? Yes, all in of there the soil well? is going to go. So just lift it up in chunks. It's like sort of um, serving a pie that's uh, <laughs> falling apart. You know when you make a huge pie and the first slice always falls apart when you put it on the plate. Just, oh. Everyone, with, is, everyone. with the experts <laughs> looking down on me, I'm just so really good. worried. You see, I, I have no idea that I'm, what I'm going to no. find. And you guys are, you know, sitting here, oh, you know how it is. But, uh, <laughs> and you're laughing, I know. And that's just fine. It's OK, I don't mind. And these appear to be ribs and these three leg bones. Is that a bit of charcoal? Yeah, yeah that's a piece of burnt wood, perhaps from the fire which cooked the meal. Would they have cooked the head and eaten the they head? They could have cooked, they could have. Brains of delicacy in those. Yes. Um, they sometimes, ate the brain, did they? sometimes they'd split the pig skull in half to get at the brain and the tongue. The animals provided a feast for the living, but could they also be food for the gods? Why are they making these sacrifices to the gods? What, what was the reason behind it? Sacrifice is, is gift giving. It's, it's giving presents. And the sorts of things you're giving presents here to the gods 
are also the sorts of things you're going to give as presents to other living Iron Age people. But you don't give your neighbour a sheep skull, do you? Well, you give... <laughs> <laughs> this is a pretty, pretty disgusting thing but to give But you give somebody. your neighbour food. Yeah. So, you know, particularly in these sorts of societies, food and feasting is one of the main ways in which you sort of... Uh, you say thank you to people or you get them to do things for you. So it seems that back in the Iron Age, barbecues would have been a popular way to entertain friends and keep the gods happy at the same time. Judging from the variety of coins that Ken had found, these prehistoric barbies were very popular, drawing people from across the Midlands and beyond, as far as Yorkshire to the north and Hampshire to the south. These were long distances to travel in Iron Age Britain and more evidence that our site had once been very important. Before we left, JD made one final sweep for any missed coins. There it is. Look, there's another one. There we go. What have you got? Two oh, lucky silver thing. Look at those. Iron Age coins. Beautiful. <laughs> I've only ever found two coins before. Oh, you, well, you've just doubled that. I've just doubled Doing my about In the space of about five minutes. Brilliant. So how does that feel? I feel really brilliant. A bit chuffed? I am. Just show, also just shows how many coins there still are in the plow side. Yeah, I mean, you think this has all been gone, gone no, over I know. so much, and then there's another two. You're there's going to take two. those away. I'm going to take those away. JD's coins turned out to be amongst the last we found. Ken's field had finally dried up. But now we had thousands of coins, the largest hoard of Iron Age coins in Britain. But they were not yet treasure. The Treasure Act states that that was for the local coroner to decide. We weren't allowed to film the court proceedings, but we were allowed to have a quick look before the hearing began. After we left, the coroner made his ruling. The coins were clearly over 300 years old and made of over 10% precious metal. The hoard was duly declared treasure. The next stage would be to fix Ken's reward. Meanwhile, the hoard's discovery was no longer a secret. News of Ken's find was spreading fast. <laughs> oh, you're all over the paper! <laughs> but it wasn't just the coins that were treasure. The helmet was too. I decided to get back on the road to take one last look at Ken's Roman helmet. As you can see, not a lot has changed. It still looks a bit like a rusty old helmet to me. But these few precious pieces are all we have to go on. This lion's head, it could be a symbol of strength, a fitting image for a soldier's helmet. And this cheek piece still shows clear signs of decoration. Luckily, the British Museum does have two beautiful Roman cavalry helmets on display. And they offer a tantalising glimpse into what our helmet might once have looked like. We may never know when the helmet and the coins were put into the ground. All we can say is that it was sometime close to the Roman conquest of Britain in AD 43. This would have been a terrible time for Iron Age Britons. They were faced with the terror of a foreign invasion. If there was ever a time to throw thousands of coins into the ground as an offering to the gods, it was then. So that takes care of the helmet, the coins and the bones. The next step is for the British Museum to help try to acquire the hoard for the nation, but that could be expensive. According to the newspapers, it could cost £350,000. Meanwhile, Ken and Hazel had an opportunity to make one last journey with their prize finds. It was now time to tell the world about their hoard. But first, they had to find their way through a network of secret passages beneath the British Museum, as the world's press awaited. It doesn't look very much on this table, um, but this is one of the most important, I think, discoveries of Iron Age treasure to be found for many years. Word about the find spread fast. Ken and Hazel were finally able to tell their story to the world. Oh, it's such a relief to be able to talk about it now. We've kept our secret, we've done it. So we headed home to come clean with the locals. Ken and Hazel have managed to keep the secret for two years and finally the time has come to tell the village exactly what's been going on. 
We invited everyone to a meeting at the village hall, but I can't tell you which village because that's still got to stay a secret. JD's here to help tell the story. He begins by setting the scene. This discovery dates to about 2,000 years ago. This is the period of British history we call the Iron Age. And this is the period which comes to an abrupt end when the Romans arrive in AD 43, and if you're an Iron Age expert, spoilt everything. <laughs> I don't like the Romans. Now, we do get you know, quite a few Iron Age coin hoards every year. So what was special about this one? Coins were coming up in huge numbers. We now think there's at least 3,000. Um, just to give you some sense of scale, until this came along, only 32,000 Iron Age coins had ever been found in the whole of Great Britain. So this has added 10% extra to our coins. If that wasn't good enough, the animal bones came up. There was more bone in the soil than there was soil. Huge quantities of animals are being eaten on this hilltop. And what perhaps is happening then at this place is, at certain times of the year, huge numbers of people come here with animals. They meet, they have tribal councils, they elect rulers, they arrange marriages, all sorts of illicit getting drunk and drinking strange substances take place, you know, big partying is happening. And part of that is you know, the need to have proper religious ceremonies. And that's probably what the site we're dealing with here is. Before we had discovered that find, no one would have guessed that the East Midlands was that wealthy and that important. And if that story is correct, then this site isn't of regional importance, it isn't simply of national importance. This is European Champions League stuff. This is one of the ten most important recent discoveries of Iron Age things in the whole of Western Europe. Thank you very much. Powerful stuff. But what did the villagers make of their newly discovered prehistoric past? Are you quite sort of shocked with the, the size? The size of it, yeah, the amount of it. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. We just didn't expect anything so large and important. It's absolutely tremendous and so exciting. Did you have any idea about what was going on? No, I thought Not someone really, was building were... a bypass or something <laughs> awful when I saw the portal. Good. So you knew there was some digging going up on the Oh, yes, oh, yes. No, I'd, kept, I'd kept my eye on it, but I think it's absolutely yeah. wonderful. We left the villagers to digest this heady mix of prehistory and took stock of the situation in the local pub. Uh, Ken, where does it all go from here? Back to field walking, but we're going to walk the other side of the field where all the good stuff is. Yeah. In the hope of another find? Exactly. Oh yes, ever hopeful, yeah. yes. And what about you, JD? Uh, well, first job, we're going to work out which museum is going to want to try and acquire this find and then an awful lot of form filling to apply for the money to make sure the museum gets it. Yeah. And what happens if you don't raise that money? If if a museum isn't successful in raising money, then the fine goes back to Ken and the landowner. So it's just money you want? Mm. A lot of it. Oh, well, let's make a start. Fortunately, if the British Museum finds it hard to help raise enough cash, they will always be able to call on Ken for the odd extra coin. 